Cumberland Stories is brought to you by the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. Come to historic Cherokee, North Carolina. Our story lives on. And by the Angler's Edge from Speed Tech for information you can use. When you picture Arizona, you probably conjure images of saguaro cactus and arid desert vistas. The thought of a cold water fish like a trout might not immediately spring to mind as a native of the Grand Canyon state. But just a few hours outside Phoenix, in the high mountain streams and lakes of the White Mountains, there lives a trout that can only be found right there in the headwaters of the Salt and Little Colorado Rivers. The rare and unusual Apache trout offers anglers a chance to touch history and conservation at the same moment, and in doing so, they can celebrate a conservation success story. The Fort Apache Indian Reservation, home to the White Mountain Apache Indian Tribe, holds hundreds of miles of streams that are the historic home of the Apache trout. Now, when rainbow and brown trout were imported into these streams years ago, the Apache trout numbers naturally began to dwindle, and the Apache Indians actually closed fishing for the trout as they recognized their numbers were going down. The fish are on the endangered species list, although they've recently been upgraded to threatened status. The good news is that if everything continues on course, they could be the first fish to ever be taken off the endangered species list, and not because they've gone extinct. This is due in large part to a collaborative effort between the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the White Mountain Apache Indian Tribe, the U.S. Forest Service, and the Arizona Game and Fish. I'm Angie Thompson, and today I'm lucky enough to have the opportunity to fish these headwater streams for a species of trout that I can't catch anywhere else on Earth, and to hear the story of why they're still here. Oh! All right, oh my gosh, look at that. So, let's get him up here and see what you've got, okay. but we're, we're on, is it's this a, Paradise it's a, Creek? We're on the North Fork of the White River. North Fork of the White River, and all of this water is gonna flow eventually into the Colorado. No, no. this is gonna flow into the Salt River. The Salt River, okay, mm -hmm. and then where does it go? It goes into all the homes of Phoenix residents. <laughs> there you go. Boy, oh, look at that. You know, it doesn't yeah. seem like the setting that we're in right now does not seem like what you would typically think of when you think of Arizona. You got hooks pretty good, though. There you go. Let me take your rod for you. Sure. And is it an Apache trout? Yes, it is. Well, let's get them up here. I'd really like to see how you can determine and how to distinguish an Apache trout from a uh, rainbow trout, I guess, or a brown. They're very speckled, kind right, of real right. like that. Yep. And a lot of times, the fins have a real orange coloring, but you huh. see, it's not real iridescent like right. like the rainbow trout. Right, right, right. Wow, that is real so speckled. cool. What a what a neat thing to catch this little guy. Look, we probably should get him back in the water right. and um, mm -hmm. and let him go back to eating and breeding, right? There you go. Yeah. Look at that little guy. Wow, he's got a ton of spots, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. And he's going to we'll be just, hang just out by fine. Our feet for a while. Yep. This what? place up here on Fort Apache Reservation, we've got a, a lot of uh, hundreds of miles of streams that you can uh, come up here and spend a day fishing, get the four species of trout: brook, brown, rainbow, and Apache. Uh, we uh, have different types of fishing opportunities for different. Uh, anglers they prefer we have fly fishing only lakes also some stretches of streams on fly zone so we try to promote that and give those guys with uh that prefer to fly fish that opportunity when cumberland stories returns we'll see more of the rare apache trout and visit the hatcheries where its recovery efforts were bolstered Today on Cumberland Stories, we're on the Fort Apache Indian Reservation fishing for the Apache trout in eastern Arizona. Now, this trout is listed as threatened on the endangered species list, but many populations of the fish are fishable, and some harvest is even allowed. The fish is making a comeback after almost being wiped out by imported rainbow and brown trout. Matt David grew up in this area. In fact, his father is a biologist that runs the fish hatchery that has been essential in recovery of the species. We waded into Paradise Creek, 
with our two weight fly rods and elk hair caddis ready for the action that these yellow-bellied fish supply. Now it's tough oh. to see him in the shade. Oh. There he is. Oh! Oh! Scooped him right up. Well, you know what? That's, that's about a normal size Apache that you'd catch in here. Yeah. A lot of them are, are small. That's okay, they're though. Fun. They're really and they're, you know, it's such an incredible story to know that you've caught this fish that, you know, was almost gone and now is back and may, you know, like I said, may be taken off the, the uh, endangered species list All, one day. Altogether. Right? Yeah. And that would be the first time ever. First time ever a fish would be delisted. Right. And this little guy, whoops, maybe the one. <laughs> Matt's father actually helped establish the brood stock of Apache trout in the Alchese Williams Creek National Fish Hatchery. This is one of 70 national fish hatcheries managed by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And it grows Apache trout to release into the streams and lakes on the Apache Indian Reservation. Uh, Williams Creek is the center for Apache trout culture. And we selected Williams Creek primarily because of its water supply. We have a large supply of cold spring water here at Williams Creek where we can hatch eggs and we can carry the fish through its entire life cycle. Uh, the water here is just perfect for rearing trout. The comeback of the Apache trout is truly a collaborative effort. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service partnered with the White Mountain Apache Indians, the Arizona Game of Fish, the U.S. Forest Service, and even Trout Unlimited to get all the help it needed to conserve this fish. It is truly important to the history and heritage of this area and consequently, it's important to all of us. Coming up on Cumberland Stories, a hike into the high mountain headwater streams to see how biologists keep the Apache trout genetically pure and a behind the scenes look at their efforts to manage the species. Cumberland Stories will be right back. On Cumberland Stories today, we're fishing for an endangered species, the Apache trout. Actually, the fish has been upgraded to threatened status, and through careful management, some populations are fishable in the White Mountains of eastern Arizona. I'm Angie Thompson, and I've been fishing today with a local angler who is as avid a trout fisherman as they come. Matt David learned to fish under the watchful eye of his father, Bob, who's a biologist for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Now, Bob had watched the two of us fish all morning, so I finally managed to coax him down to the stream to wet a line of his own just as one of those mountain storms brewed up. That's a fish! Woohoo! Yeah, I'm gonna let him kinda get tired here. I don't want him to come off. That's a nice fish. Yeah, is that a brown trout or an Apache trout? Can you tell? Well, you get a flash of gold from both a brown uh -huh. and an Apache, but that's right. an Apache. Okay, can you tell if he's a hatchery fish or, or a naturally? Oh, no, don't come off, don't come off, don't come off. Ooh, yeah, very nice. Well, we speak of con condition of a fish, mm -hmm. and the condition of a fish is kind of the ratio of its length to its depth. Right. And uh, the Apache trout, this has a fairly deep body. Yep. And uh, looks very healthy. Really? All so the fins are, are perfect. Now, each species of fish whoops, whoops. Oh. has its own. Oh, well, Could he's gone. It? Yep. He's gone, you got me now. Managing an endangered species like the Apache trout is a complex task. The various agencies working to bring the species back work in several different capacities to ensure their numbers. One of the things that we have to do is to be able to assess populations. How strong are the populations? What are the population sizes? What's the condition of the fish? One of the things that we use electrofishing for is a relatively unbiased way to sample the population. You and I know that fishing is sometimes a little biased, but electrofishing is, is a rather unbiased sampling technique, not harmful to the fish, um, but it is a way for us to get a look at the fish and get a look at their population size and structure. We have two guys on my side, on my side, both sides. We have two people dip netting. That's what they're using for dip nets. I have the electrofishing unit on my back. Uh, and that generally, this just basically, uh, you have a dry cell battery on your back and you can adjust the voltage and the amperage on, with, with your backpack. And what that does is it sends a current through the river, through the water, and what will eventually happen is uh, it'll 
it'll stiffen up a fish to where it contracts, the muscles contract within the fish. So that gives us time to dip net these fish. In addition to monitoring their numbers in the headwaters through electrofishing, they also do streamside health assessment, which is sort of like bringing a laboratory to the water. Well, what we do here is, in the field, is collect samples from fish and test them for diseases. It's important to know which diseases the fish have, and sometimes they don't have any, and that's just as important to know that they don't have them. Because when fish are stocked or moved around, we don't want to move a disease with them. So it's real important to know the status of the hatchery fish, if they're going to be stocked out, as well as if you do a stream to stream transfer of fish. What I do is take a skin scrape, put it on a slide, and examine it under a microscope. Parasites like to avoid being rubbed off by the fish in the water, so they'll be often at the base of the fins. I also take some gill tissue and look at it because that's another place that I'll find a lot of parasites. Then from there we want to take a bacterial culture. So what I do is take a bacterial culture from the kidney tissue because if there's a bacteria present that's making the fish sick, that's the easiest place to find it. After that what I do is take some kidney and spleen tissue and put it in that pink media you saw in that, that little vial. And we take that back to the lab and that media is designed to keep the virus alive till we can take it back to the lab and test it. I also made a preparation on a slide where you saw me smearing out some kidney tissue. And that's to check for a bacterial pathogen that's called bacterial kidney disease. There's no known treatment for that, so we want to be sure we don't spread that around or that a particular population doesn't have it. And then I take some tissue back as a confirmation testing in one of those little micro centrifuge tubes. I take some kidney tissue back to the lab and in case we need to do DNA testing, then we can confirm what we visually saw by looking for the bacteria. And then finally I took and cut off the head and I collect that. We take it back to the lab, remove all the flesh, and then grind the bones up and we look for whirling disease in the bones. And unfortunately we have to do lethal sampling to detect these pathogens. We hope that someday we could just clip a fin and let the fish swim off, but we're not quite there yet. We're working on it, but right now we have to sacrifice the fish for the good of the other fish. In addition to this, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the White Mountain Apache Tribe work together on fish barriers, reproducing naturally occurring barriers high up in these mountain streams that actually prevent fish from migrating up, which in turn keeps the Apache trout above the barriers genetically pure. We have about 20 rock gabion barriers on about as many streams. In addition to that, we also have natural barriers. Uh, these natural barriers are very critical to Apache trout recovery and restoration, conservation, because that, those natural barriers have, have actually protected these genetically pure populations. Part of the, the aging process of a barrier is, as you can see behind me, you can see the basket, the wire basket, and the rocks inside that. Uh, it's critical to the functioning of the barrier, and by functioning I mean that it will prevent fish from migrating through, passing through that barrier, through this structure. It needs to silt in, and by silting in, what I mean is that there's silt coming down through the watershed over a period of years will backfill in behind this barrier and create um, some fill so that the water above this barrier is just flowing over the barrier as it would just be flowing over the stream bed. So there's not a pool behind this barrier. In addition to that, there's not a pool below this barrier. Below this vertical fall that you see is a splash pad. That splash pad breaks up any kind of pool structure that might form for those fish to stage in and jump the barrier. Trout Unlimited is a, a cold water conservation organization. It's comprised mainly of anglers and our mission is to conserve, protect, and restore North America's fisheries and their watersheds. And here we have a native fish that um, we saw an opportunity here in Arizona to, to promote that mission. And uh, we became involved in the late 80s, 1988, 89, in Apache trout recovery. And that was spearheaded through a chapter called the Old Palatula Chapter out of Tucson. And um, we've since expanded that and we have members from across the state. We have other organizations that are also involved in this Federation of Fly Fishers. And then there are some parties, peripheral groups, if you will, Mothers for Clean Water 
and there are a number of other organizations that are involved in this as NGOs. The Apache trout we've seen today have all been in headwater streams, so naturally they're a smaller fish. The White Mountain Apache Indian Tribe also manages some trophy trout water in the high mountain ponds that are in this range. When Cumberland Stories returns, we'll take a look at some of this alpine pond fishing on the Fort Apache Indian Reservation. Cumberland Stories have been made possible by the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. Come to historic Cherokee, North Carolina. Our story lives on. And by Oh Boy Alberto Beef Jerky, the great tasting portable protein snack. You're watching Cumberland Stories on the Fort Apache Indian Reservation high in the White Mountains of Eastern Arizona. Today we've been following the story of the Apache trout, an endangered species that has been managed so well in this area that it just might be on track to be taken off the list. We've seen a lot of this fish in the small headwater streams in which it naturally occurs, but the White Mountain Indian tribe also manages many of its high mountain lakes and ponds for big trophy trout. Christmas Tree Lake is managed as a trophy fisheries lake and it's really there to promote the Apache trout. We only allow 20 anglers per day and that's a, on a seasonal basis from Memorial Day to Labor Day. The way we manage natural resources on the reservation is it's just not one species or one uh, natural resource, it's the whole thing. Once one thing collapses, everybody tends to see that it's going to have a domino effect and everything else collapses. So when we manage fish, we manage for the water, the grasses, the trees. When you see a person catch a fish, you really look at everything around, not just one person being happy with the fish, it's everything else that makes it a you know, one, wonderful picture. During my time in eastern Arizona and the White Mountains, I heard all of the people involved with managing this fish talking with great pride of the Apache trout being delisted or taken off the endangered species list. If and when that happens, it'll be the first time a fish is delisted because it has not gone extinct, because its numbers have rebounded. But every time someone talked about delisting the Apache trout, they were very quick to put in a cautionary tag of, well, we've still got a long way to go before that happens. Or there's still a lot of work to do, you know. If we can bring Apache trout to the point where we consider it recovered, it can be removed entirely from the list of threatened and endangered species, it will be the first fish ever that was removed from the list because it didn't go extinct. It truly is a success story. This is people working together in order to conserve a resource. It's our resource now that we must manage. We must manage now for resources and opportunities tomorrow. But there's something here that all of the people involved with this project can be proud of, regardless of whether the Apache trout is delisted or not. And that is just the simple fact that these fish are still here. The recovery of Apache trout is certainly something to look forward to. It would be a uh, culmination of, of my career. It would uh, certainly be uh, a high point of my life. I get a lot of personal satisfaction from these type of projects. Uh, my heart is near and dear to the Apache Trout, to the Apache Trout program, and to the, the lands that the Apache Trout are tied to. This is the only place in the world that you will find this species. And it's a wonderful feeling to conserve this species for the future, for the people in the future to be able to come here to be able to fish for this species, to know that it's protected in its home range, it's very meaningful. And people like Bob Davis can sit on the bank and watch his son Matt catch the fish that's been the focus of all this work by all these people for all these years. When we were down on the river uh, thinking that uh, I had spent 20 years of my life rearing the Apache trout, and here's my son uh, catching the Apache trout. So that, uh, that was in itself uh, a meaningful moment for me. This has been a presentation of ESPN, the worldwide leader in sports.